Bismillahirrahmanirrahim La ikraha fi ad-din Katabayna ar-rushtu min al-ghay There should be no compulsion in religion Surely the right way has become distinct from error The Holy Quran chapter 2 verse 257 respected chairman and honored guests of the jalsa salana assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu a few weeks ago america celebrated its 234th year as a nation as members of the amadiya muslim community we proudly joined in this celebration for some Americans, a showing of loyalty by American Muslims might come as a bit of a surprise. With America engaged in two wars with Muslim-majority nations, Iraq and Afghanistan, and recent Gallup polls showing an unprecedented level of discrimination against American Muslims, it would appear difficult for American Muslims to take pride in the country they live in. Yet despite all of the polls and the negative media attention paid to Islam in America, there probably isn't a better time in our history to be proud to be an American Muslim. This might sound like a tall claim, but perhaps some international perspective might help. Consider for a moment the state of religious freedom for Muslims in Europe over the past few months. Last November, 57.5% of all voters in Switzerland supported a constitutional amendment banning the construction of new minarets, an Islamic symbol found in mosques. Last month, in the Netherlands, the anti-Islam Freedom Party of Geert Wilders won 23 seats in Parliament. Wilders has publicly demanded that the Quran be outlawed and that Muslim women who wear the headscarf be taxed. Last week, the French parliament approved a ban of the burqa, or the full Islamic veil, by a vote of 336 to 1. And support for a ban on the burqa is now widespread across Europe, with majority votes in Spain, Britain, and Germany. Now, for American Muslims, these European headlines come as a bit of a shock. Compared to European Muslims, American Muslims appear to be progressing much better. And our President Barack Obama recognized this very fact in his speech last year to the Muslim world in Cairo. He said, and I quote, Freedom in America is indivisible from the freedom to practice one's religion. That is why there is a mosque in every state of our union and over 1200 mosques within our borders. That is why the US government has gone to court to protect the right of women and girls to wear hijab and to punish those who would deny it." End quote. No state in America, no state, has laws that ban minarets, headscarves, or any other kind of Islamic custom or practice of the kind France, Switzerland, and other European nations seek to implement. In the middle of this country, Oklahoma, in 2004, a law was passed to ban the wearing of the headscarf in public schools, but the federal court quickly struck down the law as unconstitutional. And this past April, Oregon ended an 87-year-old ban on teachers wearing headscarves in public schools. What is it about America that enables American Muslims to exercise their faith more freely than anywhere else in the world? Well, my speech this morning 
tackles that very important question in four parts. First, I'll discuss the concept of religious freedom in America. Second, I'll discuss the concept of religious freedom in Islam. And in so doing, I'll underscore the striking similarities between the two concepts. Third, I'll discuss how the modern Muslim world has deviated from the true Islamic concept of religious freedom in profound and even tragic ways. And finally, I'll discuss some of our responsibilities as American Muslims to champion the cause of religious freedom in America. So let me begin by discussing the origins of religious freedom here in America. America's early founding reflects a deep commitment to religious freedom. Most of the European settlers who came to North America in the 17th century, they fled Europe to seek religious freedom. The early immigrants to America, the Puritans, sought desperately to practice their own brand of Christianity. And they founded Massachusetts, what they called the New Israel, a new commonwealth based on a covenant between God and his people. But the puritanical vision of a holy society was quickly met with resistance. And the first and most famous dissenter, Roger Williams, himself a Puritan minister, disagreed with the states interfering with religion. And he put forth the first American case for freedom of conscience for all people. He was banished from Massachusetts, but he founded Rhode Island, the first American colony to grant freedom of conscience to people of all faiths. And the Rhode Island experiment quickly drew traction and momentum in the rest of early America. For example, William Penn, a Quaker, famously founded the colony of Pennsylvania, which he described as a holy experiment to preserve religious liberty for all people. In 1776, the Declaration of Independence established America as a nation and declared emphatically the principle of equality for all people. But even the Declaration of Independence does not explicitly refer to religious liberty. It took 11 years after that when the founding fathers of this country wrestled with this idea of religious freedom to be included in the U.S. Constitution. And the father of our Constitution, the architect of that document, James Madison, set forth a powerful defense of religious freedom as an inalienable right. And his ideas formed the basis for the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which was ratified in 1791. Now, it's rather fitting to be speaking about religious freedom here in Virginia. If you drive south about two hours from here, you will hit Chesterfield County, home to 318,000 people. 225 years ago, the citizens of Chesterfield County did something remarkable. On November 14, 1785, they signed an unprecedented petition for religious freedom which they submitted to the Virginia State Assembly. The Library of Congress has preserved that petition, and it reads, and, and I quote a portion of it, let Jews, Muslims, and Christians of every denomination enjoy religious liberty. Let them find their advantage in living under your laws, end quote. These sentiments, 225 years ago, ultimately found their way into the Bill of Rights a few, a few years later. And the first words of the Bill of Rights consist of the religion clauses of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now taken together, these two religion clauses safeguard religious liberty by protecting religious beliefs from government interference. And now, almost 225 years later, the religion clauses of the First Amendment remain intact and continue to safeguard our religious liberty. So the concept of religious freedom in America has a rich history, but the essential ingredients of this concept are definitely not new. In large part, from the political writings of the British philosopher John Locke and the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and they strongly resonate with the Islamic concept of religious freedom. 
In fact, Islam advanced the concept of religious freedom over 1,000 years before America was founded. So let me now turn to the Islamic concept of religious freedom. The starting point for this analysis must begin with the verse that I recited at the beginning of my speech, La ikraha fi deen katabayana rushto min al -ghay. There should be no compulsion in religion. Surely the right way has become distinct from error. Among all other revealed texts, only the Quran stresses religious freedom in such unambiguous and clear terms. In Islam, compulsion is incompatible with religion. Faith is an individual concern and commitment. It is a voluntary act born out of conviction and freedom. Believing Muslims should not compel another to believe in Islam because they've earned no such right. All people must be permitted to find the truth through their own path. And elsewhere in the Quran, in chapter 10, verse 100, we read, and I quote, And if your Lord had enforced his will, surely all who are on the earth would have believed together. Will you then force men to become believers? End quote. This verse demonstrates that religious freedom is part of Allah's design in Islam. Indeed, Allah admonishes Muslims not to use force in matters of faith. Forced faith is no faith at all. Finally, an entire chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Kafirun, specifies the prescribed conduct of Muslims with non-believers. Allah demands that believers declare emphatically that they will not force another to believe. Lakum dinakum waliyadin. For you, your religion. For me, my religion. Again, this is a strong and unambiguous proof of religious tolerance in Islam. But my friends, these Quranic verses are not just theoretical pronouncements. They form the basis of true Islamic governance and protection of religious freedom. Indeed, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa cherished these Quranic pronouncements and practically enforced them throughout his life. He actively promoted peace, tolerance, and compassion for all non-Muslim minorities living in Arabia. He just didn't demand religious tolerance. His sunnah, his example, was to provide legal and constitutional protections for religious minorities. And for purposes of this speech, I choose two examples, two historic documents that he authored that are here for all of us to remember. The first document is the Charter of Medina. This was written in 622 AD. It was a formal agreement, constitution, between the Prophet of Islam and all of the significant tribes and families of Medina, including the Muslims, the Jews, and the non-Muslim Arabs. Many scholars refer to this document as the first ever written constitution of a nation state in history. Many scholars say that this document, which predates the Magna Carta by six centuries, is unprecedented in scope. It was executed and implemented for 10 years and applied to 10,000 citizens in Medina at the time. The Prophet ﷺ himself commissioned a census, the first ever census, and he discovered that 45% of all citizens in Medina consisted of Arabs. 40% consisted of Jews. Only 15% of the total population in Medina at the time consisted of Muslims. In other words, the Prophet wrote the Charter of Medina as a minority sovereign. His express goal was to govern a multi-religious, pluralistic society. This charter consists of 47 clauses, which set forth the formation of a sovereign nation-state with a common citizenship for all communities. And it provides fundamental human rights protections such as the freedom of conscience, the freedom of religion, equality for all, and cooperation. If you pick it up and review Clause 25, that specifically deals with religious freedom for Jews and Arabs at the time. So in short, the Charter of Medina was the first document in history to establish religious freedom as a fundamental constitutional right. But the Prophet ﷺ's commitment to religious freedom did not just stop with the Charter of Medina. With Islam's rising influence in Arabia by 628 AD, 
Jewish and Christian tribes endured severe struggles with certain Muslim forces. And Holy Prophet ﷺ penned a series of letters to various kings in the Arab Peninsula, declaring his intention for peace and cooperation. And one of those letters is a letter written to the monks of the St. Catherine Monastery in Mount Sinai. It's known today as the Charter of Privileges, and I'll read a portion of it for you right now. And I quote, This is a message from Muhammad, son of Abdullah, as a covenant to those who adopt Christianity near and far. We are with them. Verily I, my servants, my helpers, and my followers defend them because Christians are my citizens. And by Allah, I hold out against anything that displeases them. No compulsion is to be on them. Neither are their judges to be removed from their jobs, nor their monks from their monasteries. No one is to destroy a house of their religion, to damage it, or to carry anything from it to Muslim homes. Should anyone take any of these, he would spoil God's covenant and disobey his prophet. Verily, they are my allies and have my secure charter against all that they hate. No one is to force them to travel. No one is to force them to fight. The Muslims are to fight for them. Their churches are to be respected. And no one of my ummah is to disobey this letter and this covenant until the last day. Nada takdeer! Islam! Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa, Hazrat Khatimul Anbiya, Rahmatul Alameen, Narat Takbir. Western Islamic scholar Marmaduke Pikthal, he comments on this letter, and I quote, The charter which Muhammad wasallam granted to the Christian monks of Sinai is a living document. If you read it, you will see that it breeds not only goodwill, but actual love. He gave to the Jews of Medina precisely the same treatment as he did to the Muslims. He never was aggressive against any man or class of men. The story of his reception of Christian and Zoroastrian visitors is on record. There is not a trace of religious intolerance in any of this." End quote. I did some research and I discovered that the St. Catherine Monastery at Mount Sinai, which is now in present-day Egypt, has been designated by the UN as a World Heritage Site and is considered to be the oldest active Christian monastery in the world. In fact, the official website of this uh, monastery mentions this letter and proudly commemorates it and features it prominently on its website. The original version of this letter is in the royal treasury in Constantinople in Turkey. And a copy, a certified copy of this letter is on its website. This discovery was also mentioned by our beloved fourth Khalifa as well in talking about the letter. And to this date, the St. Catherine monks continue to practice their faith without restriction based on the protections granted to them 1400 years ago. And the entire world stands as a witness to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu sublime act of religious tolerance. My dear friends, America and Islam share a remarkably similar approach to religious freedom. It is an approach grounded in absolute freedom of conscience and belief, the free exercise of religion for all people, freedom from state control of religion, and mutual respect, cooperation, and peace. Let me now turn briefly to the third part of my speech, and that is the state of the Muslim world. It is a tragic irony that much of the Islamic world has lost sight of Islam concerning religious freedom. Countries such as Indonesia, Egypt, and Pakistan currently have laws on their books that suffocate the rights of religious minorities. A dramatic example of this is one that hits very close to our homes and our hearts. Six weeks ago in Lahore, the world witnessed a brutal crime against humanity. When armed gunmen massacred 86 members of our minority community and injured hundreds more. But this wasn't a random act of religious violence in Pakistan. This was a direct byproduct of decades of state-sponsored, institutionalized persecution of religious minorities. 
Pakistan is the only Muslim country in the world to explicitly define who is or is not a Muslim for purposes of the law. It is the only Muslim country in the world to have a constitutional amendment that denies the right of a minority Muslim community to call itself Muslim. It is the only Muslim country in the world to criminalize fundamental religious practices by punishment of death. It is the only Muslim country in the world to require its passport applicants to declare a minority community to be non-Muslim. How would the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, react to this state of affairs? Would he even recognize Pakistan as an Islamic nation? What would he say to the so-called Muslims who sent teenagers to Lahore to bomb hundreds of worshippers during Friday prayers? To the so-called Muslims who burned alive 11 Christians in Gojra last year? To the so-called Muslims last month who bombed the Sufi religious shrine? What would he say to these people? The same Prophet Muhammad who vigorously defended the rights of the oppressed the orphans and the minorities. The same prophet who gave refuge to a Christian delegation at his own mosque in Medina, the same prophet who wrote a constitution in defense of the Jews and Arabs at his time, the same prophet Muhammad wasallam, who said that differences of opinion and diversity are blessings in society. When will Pakistan heed the example of the founder of Islam? Nara takbir. Azrat Khatibul Anbiya, Mosne Insaniyat, Rahmatul Alameen, Nara Takbir. I wanted to turn now to the last part of my speech, and that is our obligations as American Amity Muslims. My dear brothers and sisters, we are proud to be American. We cherish and enjoy freedom of religion more than any other nation on earth. Our constitution. The U.S. Constitution is more Islamic than the constitutions of Islamic nations. We are witnessing the erosion of religious freedom in the world. We witnessed our fellow Ahmadi Muslims massacred for practicing their faith. But Allah will never let the sacrifices of our Ahmadi martyrs go to waste. Their memories are alive in all of us. We must step forward and safeguard the original teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. We are Muslims who believe in the Messiah. Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, who came to rescue Islam from the clutches of militancy. We must proclaim loudly that we are the protectors of Islam's original teachings. We believe in religious freedom for all people. We must not rest until the Islamic world rids itself of the laws that embolden those who kill the innocent and the vulnerable. To my fellow American Ahmadi Muslim youth who are here in attendance today, this is our time to rise up. This is our time. We have lived for many, many decades as second generation immigrants in peace without any restriction on our Amity faith. We enjoy freedoms that others do not. We must not sit idle and watch atrocities such as Lahore to continue unabated. We must heed the words of our Khalifa and carry the torch of religious freedom to our leaders and our lawmakers and demand a change in the Islamic world. I conclude with the exhortations of our beloved Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih Rabeh, Ramaullah Ta'ala, who addressed the Ahmadis of North America at the Jalsa Salana in 1992. And I close with those words. He said, Eh America or Canada ke Ahmadiyo. Eh America or Canada ke Ahmadiyo. Tum kab tak bheron ki labas mein zindagi basar karoge? Utho aur in labaso ko chaak kar do. Tum khuda ke sher ho aur sheron ki tarah dandanate hue aur garajte hue janglo par fatayab ho. Bas khuda tumhare saath ho. Khuda tumhare saath ho. Khuda tumhare saath ho. Islam. خلافت احمدیہ خلیفت المسیح الرابع نرے تکبیر O Ahmadis of America and Canada For how long will you remain in sheep's clothing? Wake up and discard that clothing You are the lions of Allah And like lions with might and tenacity You must conquer the jungles ahead of you 
May God be with you. May God be with you. May God be with you. May Allah give us lion-like courage to fight for religious freedom all over the world. Amen.